This podcast is brought to you by the Albany Public Library main branch and the generosity of listeners like you. What is a podcast? God, Daddy, these people talk as much as you do. Razib Khan's Unsupervised Learning. Thanks for listening to the ungated version of the Unsupervised Learning Podcast. If you want to read some essays on some of these topics, please check out razib.substack.com. Again, that's razib.substack.com. Thank you. You know that genetics plays a huge role in our health, and more people are using genetic testing to determine risk for diseases like cancer for themselves and their kids than ever before. So I want to tell you about ORCID. It's the only company that does whole genome testing for embryos, testing before your child is born. If you're doing IVF, this is a clear choice now because now you can reduce risk for thousands of single gene disorders, including heritable forms of autism, pediatric cancers, and birth defects. Check them out at orchidhealth.com. Hey, everybody. This is Razib with the Unsupervised Learning Podcast. And I am here uh, with my friend, Dr. Wilfred Riley, who I think you will probably know uh, from his various podcast experience, um, appearances, his essays, his book reviews, his scholarly publications, his books. Uh, I'll put all the links in the show notes, but um, he's also a professor uh, in Kentucky. And um, can you give, I mean, look, I know academics, you got like, you know, various affiliations here and there. Uh, just tell me like what your top line, like what you usually tell people, like, what do you do, Wolfred? Like, who are you with? I'm who, are your people as, who are your people, as they would say? Woof, woof. Uh, I'm an associate professor of political science at Kentucky State University. And other than that, I'm a fil- the, the standard journals and so on. But that that is my uh, one line job to script. OK. And like um, you were not always in academia. Um, and I think uh, you're not like what I, my understanding is you're not one of those like, you know, undergrad to grad school to professorship. Right. You did some other things. Can you talk about your background a little bit? Like, where are you from? Like, um, you know, I. I, I follow you on Twitter, um, social media X, whatever you want to call it. Uh, and my understanding is you're not from the hood. Um, like you just made a face. <laughs> the listeners oh, are like, yeah. So like, just, just give, give a general sense because, um, you know, uh, I, I think a lot of people don't know. Yeah. So I've actually had a really interesting life. I mean, the, the hood is a relative term. I mean, I would think of the hood as an area where no one works. So in that sense, I was probably more from a series of tough working class neighborhoods. I mean, I was born on the south side of Chicago. I lived in Wicker Park on the north side when that was uh, pre-gentrification. They didn't have all the $80 backpack stores yet. So it was jokingly known as Needle Park. Um, I moved to East Aurora, which is another large, well-known kind of blue collar neighborhood in in that area. Chicago is second really only to New York in Metroplex size. I mean, you know, L.A. solved this problem just by combining all the suburbs into one city. But, I mean, if you go from Chicago out through all kind of the inner suburbs to Aurora to Naperville, I mean, all these are cities of several hundred thousand people. I mean, the population of Aurora, I think, is 297,000, something like that. I have to check it out. But um, the east side of the city is a well-known kind of, like I said, blue-collar area. It was Aurora, overall, was the murder capital of the Midwest region of the country during the period of time when I was in high school because of conflict between black gangs coming from Chicago after the, the jets, the projects were torn down, and the local Hispanic and Caucasian gangs who ended up winning the conflict, actually. But um, yeah, the east side is very heavily Latino, a fair number of Eastern European immigrants, fair number of African Americans. So those are the areas that I, I lived in coming up. And I had a pretty normal sort of lower working class childhood um, my white tees and my skateboard. I went to East Aurora Senior, which is technically considered an inner city school, so on. But um, after that, I went through a bunch of progressions in life. Like I had done well in school and I'm also black and I'm from a lower income uh, census district, which I assume helped when I was applying. And also my mom, by the way, I don't know if I mentioned this. The reason that I lived in all these areas is that my mom, who is from the Chicago Ward family, which is a upper class black family, uh, decided to sort of do good during the 1960s. So I don't know how much she talked to the rest of the family when I was a kid that they're all, that always seemed a little bit strained. And we basically lived in the areas where she taught. That's why I was in all these places. So mom taught me to read at, I mean, age one or two. I mean, there were books throughout the house and calligraphy scrolls and this kind of stuff. So I had an enormous starting advantage in addition to just benefiting from you know my background as someone who was literate 
So I ended up going to college. I went to college for quite a while. I mean, I went to uh, Southern Illinois for undergrad school, kind of legendary party school down there in the forest preserves at the bottom of the state. Uh, in Illinois, there's a joking term, BFE, but fucking Egypt, which refers to the region of the state that's in Egypt. Yeah, like all that, like Cairo, Memphis. I mean, the the, the pronunciation's a little off, but uh, Carbondale, where the mascot is the Egyptian dog, the Saluki, all that is in the deep southern corner of the state. So I went to college there, majored in political science, did reasonably well, uh, graduated, went on to law school at the University of Illinois, which was a big culture shock. I was like 20 or 21. I mean, that's not quite Ivy, but it's one of the better Big Ten law schools. And people were yep. serious. They're like 30 year old prosecutors in my classes and so on. So kind of a sharp shift upward. You know, this is how you wear a suit, young man and all that. And uh, graduated. And at this point, I expected to go on to kind of a standard upper middle class life. But that emphatically didn't happen. Like I got an offer from Southern Illinois to come back and get a Ph.D., over what was going to be based on the level of teaching the program required and so on, uh, minimum five years of study from a program called DFI, Diversifying the Faculty of Illinois, which wanted more minority and, as I recall, more male teachers in the state of Illinois, uh, in elite high schools and colleges, so on down the line. So I went back to grad school. And when I'd been in grad school for a couple of years, my mom got very sick. So I went back to Chicago to help her out. And this started like a 10 year odyssey of all these crazy jobs. Like I taught in the Chicago city colleges, which are generally in, in or close to the hood. So that's like Malcolm X college, Harry Truman, where I taught classes for a while. Uh, I was a canvas field manager for the human rights campaign, the gay and gender rights group. For are you, uh, are you, uh, are you, are you part of the rainbow nation? No, no, I'm not like, uh, so the, one of the things that a lot of people don't understand, although I think you do about the activist left is that they hire mercenaries heavily. So almost all of our canvassers were like male fighters. I mean, like guys who'd been athletes in high school or college, sort of hood dudes. There were a few passionate feminist women, but they were just as a uh, body physically. But the actual job of street canvassing in a major city is just like you, you're in Chicago or Detroit. And you go to generally poor neighborhoods where not a lot of people are already signed up as members of the group. We also went to the Magnificent Mile, which is just as intimidating in a different way. And just sort of post up like, hey, got a minute for gay marriage? And I mean, the reactions are exactly what you'd expect from, you know, physically hostile encounters to like people joyously saying yes and giving you $50 a month, people trying to make out with you. So I was one of the leaders of this group. I managed our uh, in-city and in-field canvassers, a lot of small groups under our director, for uh, quite a while. It was a very fun job. I mean, like we went on a camping canvas, as it was called, to Southern Illinois. I think we took one to the actual deep south. I didn't go on that one. But just very much. That's what Freedom Rider in my bio half jokingly refers to, that I actually was a local level leader in a civil rights organization for a couple of years. And I'm pro gay rights, but I wasn't all that passionate about the topic. It was just a fun, competitive job. And it's also a paid job, by the way. I mean, as I recall, we paid 15% yeah. of everything that you made over a very low baseline. So we had canvassers. Many of them are poor and, you know, hungry in the literal sense, if you're just starting out. But we had senior canvassers that were making probably 30, 35 bucks an hour. Because, I mean, you go to these, these areas and you might sign up 10 people at $30 a month on a good day. And you're, you're not doing that for charitable reasons. I mean, you would get 15% of the 3000 over, you know, $270. So the, the organized left is much better at the ground game than the organized, right. That's something I still notice today. But, so um, you gotta, so, so you're, um, so basically what you're saying is these people are hustlers, you know, yeah, they're, they're, run people down. Yeah. No, they're classic city kids. Yeah. I mean, like with the, the clipboard and like self-defense stick over the back yeah. and like, sunglasses yeah. in the summer and they give you like a shirt so people would put the like these bright golden and blue um equal sign shirts on i mean they were they were a fun group and they were not you know sexually inactive with one another generally speaking i mean that was actually something the leadership kind of encouraged like you know everything friendly and consensual but people would go drink hook up party so it was very much a college and kind of young person's job we had a lot of people that seemed to almost be doing it as their alternative to more traditional community service, the military or Salvation Army or something like that. No, for two years, I'm going to, you know, stand out here through the weather changes on the south side of Chicago and do this for gay rights. And the bill that we were backing, the ENDA, the Employment Non-Discrimination Act, uh, actually, I have some problems with that now as the trans movement's advanced. But uh, that and the other thing that we were backing, which is gay marriage, were pretty successful. 
like gay marriage, Obergefell passed while friends of mine were still doing this. And they were like joyous. I mean, there were giant parties throughout Chicago and New York and so on. Gay pride came the day after the decision came down in both cities, actually. So, I mean, like Roman level Bacchanals. But anyway, like, I'm not the actually like the most liberal guy. I favor general gay and women's rights. But after a couple of years of people, you know, trying to square off with me for doing that, I just got a I got a job. But that, again, was one of the classic kind of city boy jobs. Like I worked in a series of sales, mostly high end sales. I wasn't really a trader in the classic stock trading sense, but bullpens along LaSalle Street, and Michigan Avenue. Like I worked for Marcus Evans, which is a legendarily aggressive British company. And our North American headquarters is in Chicago. And the the goal of that business is taking our clients who are like the CEOs of little companies and hustling until we get them meetings with the CEOs of big companies. So we were tracking down like the CEO of Walmart Americas and trying to arrange these meetings for our clients who might be not saying whether they were or not, but like life lock companies at that level, um, weapons makers. I mean, just like it very much one of the, again, kind of classic city jobs that went on for a couple of yeah. years. Paid quite well, so I actually took a break and finished my PhD at the end of that period. And so now you're you're Dr. Riley, and um, and you're you're tenured now, or are you not tenured yet? Yeah, I'd probably say less if I wasn't tenured. I'm I'm through the first level of academic tenure. Now there are like five possible if you count emeritus with a or you know salaried chair. Yeah, yeah, yeah. But I mean, you're 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 um, your department. You're yeah. are you you're in a, you're in the HB uh, HBU. Yeah, HBCU. Yeah, historically. HBCU, yeah. yeah, historically black college. Which has turned out not to matter all that much. Like, I mean, it's, I think it's cool. I mean, I'm not racist. I, I'm on the right now politically, but I mean, like, the, <laughs> no, I'm just saying, like, the, I think they'd have an issue if the stereotype of conservatives as bigots were accurate. And so, like, every day I was going beyond the hardest hereditarianism and like reading, you know, V Dare in the office or something. But I mean, like, in, in reality, the HBCUs are like 160 of them. And they're mostly decently ranked colleges in the South. I mean, like Howard, Morehouse, Spelman are all HBCUs. Fisk is an HBCU. Um, Meharry, the medical college. So in there's almost a funny element to this without going off on a ramble, because discrimination and hiring and so on is illegal in any business. So we as an HBCU have to deal with the question of what do you do as an all black institution? Like, should we have affirmative action for whites? given that white test scores in Appalachia are often below those for the upper middle class black kids we're bringing in. And the, the, the meetings can get hilarious just unintentionally. You know, like, what should we do for this population injured by bond servitude in the past? But in a, on a day-to-day basis, it, it just doesn't, doesn't matter. That happens to be part of the institution. So we have a statue yeah. of um, the great black educator. I'm going to say Dubois, but I know that's wrong. I'm going to look that up. But I mean, we have we have that sort of thing as opposed to union generals or something like that on the campus Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. okay so you're you're at kentucky state and um you know as you said you're on the right um you know you're a quote-unquote black conservative maybe like are you are you identified as that sometimes yeah although i don't really think that that means too much um so Oh yeah, just the statues that we have are Whitney Young. We got a big. We have like oh, a Whitney big, Young. Yeah, I know Whitney Young. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, great guy. We've got a twelve foot brass Whitney Young at the top of one of those uh, majestic staircases that you see on any decent sized campus, and so on. So it's just it's him instead of General Lee or General Sherman. Um, you know, I, I like the HBCU background in practice. If you're teaching stats, it doesn't matter much. It's just half your students are going to be black. Um, But uh, the black conservatism thing, I think, is fairly interesting because being a black conservative doesn't really mean that you're black and you're a man of the right. Like when I look, listen to a lot of black conservatives, like I love John McWhorter, but I mean, he's a New York Times columnist. He's just a. Yeah, he's a lib. No, John's a lib. John's a lib now. He's 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 uh he's 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 moved back since his uh, uh, city, Manhattan Institute, City Journal. I mean, so look, I've been listening to these guys. Yeah. I think I told Glenn this story. Uh, I actually emailed John in the year 2000, I think when he was a Berkeley professor. He actually responded to me. He doesn't remember me. But I've been watching um, the Blogging Heads show. Well, now it's on you know the Glenn show that's on Substack since 2008. And back then, as you probably know, uh, Glenn was the lefty Hillary stand that was defending the Palestinians. And John was the neoconservative who, if not a Republican, um, he was on NPR in the mid two thousands defending the Iraq War, mostly just because, well, 
he was at Manhattan Institute, and he's kind of admitted that. Well, I mean, he feel like he had to have an opinion. He's like, well, I mean, all the people he knew and seemed like, you know, liberal people also were pro Iraq war. Right. So, you know, he was there. And then over the years, especially during the Obama period, they kind of like cross paths. And now now that now Glenn is the conservative and he is definitely like you, I would say he's, he's center right now. Um, definitely like soft on Trump. And John is the center left, you know, more heterodox liberal again. So, you know. Life is long, and um, you know it's hard to define these things. I mean, I will say um, I don't generally uh, use the term "black conservative" because uh, who the hell cares what your race is? Like, I no one's ever called me a the, a brown conservative. By the way, it's not all non-white people. I like if someone called me that, I'd be like, "What the hell? <laughs> like, sure. why, why are you why are you referring to me being brown? Like that's like fucking weird." You know what I'm saying? So, um, in general, I think uh, I think it's well taken. Like Shelby Steele objected to being called a black conservative because he's like, "I'm just a conservative." Or actually, back in the 1990s, he was a liberal. Um, but he was called a black conservative because he was off the reservation on affirmative action. And then eventually he just kind of came and was like, okay, whatever, I'm conservative, you know? Yeah, I, mean, no, I, I actually think the phrase black conservative is useful because it explains the distinction that's being described. And to be a black conservative is simply to be heterodox on American race issues. Like, that's all it means. So like John McWhorter obviously famously wrote uh, Losing the Race, where he described, and this to me is my one response to both racialists and hereditarians. I mean, like many variables can impact the DV, but like John goes in this book through what we've later seen uh, Brookings do in more detail, but like the study time data, how much time is black students and multiple universities spent pursuing the work? These were kids in the same program as the white kids. I mean, so you can't argue that they're in simpler classes or something. And he said, well, obviously the biggest problem for the black community today, um, paraphrasing him a little bit, but it is these issues like the fact that we study a third as much as whites or Asians, or that there's this sort of tolerance of crime as a rebellion where we're making these neo black exploitation movies in the late nineties. Like clearly, objectively, these are bigger issues than racism in upscale colleges. And that, that's something that's obviously true, that I think in a bar or on a golf course or on a basketball court, like 90 percent of white or black, certainly males would agree with, but that you're not supposed to say. So that's what makes John like an outlaw conservative on everything else. I mean, if you asked him about health care policy, yeah, I, I would assume he'd be a standard liberal, not even center left, like liberal guy. Uh, and I mean, the New York Times readership loves him. He's just a mildly he's no, more than mildly. He's just heterodox on race. So that's what that means. Like, I'm very heterodox on race. But I also like coming from the business world and so on. I'm I'm pro gun. Uh, I would stop illegal immigration almost totally. Wouldn't be very difficult to do it. I'll build some kind of border fence even and institute E-Verify. You know, I mean, just like I, I have no patience for crime whatsoever. You know, I don't think being poor is an excuse for crime. You can check the Asian data in New York City. So I actually do have a ton of conservative positions, whereas I don't think uh, John, for example, would. But we'd both fall in that heterodox on race category. Yeah, I'm going to say something really quickly. Um, it's not part of my plan, but um, the immigration thing, I've been thinking about it least. You know, I come out of, um, you know, like if you go to Wikipedia, I mean, it still lists me as a paleo conservative. Um, so um I I was pretty skeptical of like the mass immigration regime. I mean, I myself am an immigrant, but you know, I like I like the point system, you know, and all that stuff. I do have to say, like, just like straight up, I got to be honest. Twenty twenty three, the system's really broken. Mm -hmm. Um, I don't really, I don't really hold it against people for being illegal anymore. Oh, yeah. the, the 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 nightmares that I've when we came in the nineteen eighties, it was a different system. Like today's system is just so so broken that um I. I just I, I can't hold it against anyone at this point. Um, I know people who've like tried to go through the legal system, and it is a nightmare. It is a nightmare, man. Uh, but anyway, uh, just my little. Well, after twenty years, like I have changed on this partly just because the system itself is just like not sustainable. I don't know what's going to happen because the left, like basically the Democrats, do not. Um, you know, they have some identity politics issues of like people that they want uh, to not uh, go to the back of the line. Um, and you know, the Republicans don't want another 1996 as asylum to happen. Uh, they would be, you know, the Republicans, even like Trump and a lot of the restrictionists would be okay with just being like, okay, you have a STEM PhD, you can come, you know, like you gotta be a hardcore racialist, you know, it's, uh, to really, um, and that's a very small minority, um, 
Okay, I'm not going to say who. <laughs> there are people out there who like are at mainstream publications. They just like let's like let's just be like uh, honest. They just don't like Asian people, you know. But anyway, <laughs> um, but um, yeah, like um, I'm going to ask you. I want to ask you though. Um, you know, so you're you've been speaking um about various cultural political issues, and you wrote the hate crime hoax: how the left is selling a fake race war, taboo ten t- facts you can't talk about, um. I think you were, uh, did you, you know, and there were a couple of other books. Uh, uh, Lies My Liberal Teacher Told Me. Like, were you a contributor to that? Well, Lies yeah. My Liberal Teacher Told Me, I actually wrote. Um, okay. Was, the, the idea was that it might be a multi person project, but no, I just finished writing that for HarperCollins. Okay. So you're writing these books, um, and we live in a current uh, a time of, uh, you know, like about 10 years ago, we call it call out culture or social justice mm-hmm. culture. Now it's like the woke culture. The terms keep changing. Um, but we have had, uh, you know, great awakening in the second half of the teens. And, I, you know, it seems like it kind of peaked 2020, 2021, and it's receding. Like You're in the middle of this. Um, you're taking heat and fire and you know, you're in the game, you know. Mm-hmm. Um, and a lot of people are saying that it's receding and that we're possibly entering a new age. Um, or, you know, I mean, these sorts of, you know, we make like arbitrary cutoffs, but reality, they're like ebbs and flows. Uh, can you talk about what your perception is as someone who's been there in, in the in the trenches? You're, so you're talking about is, is woke culture receding, that kind of thing? I mean, yeah. Are, are, is peak woke a thing? Like, are we past peak woke or not? I, I don't think so. It depends what you mean. So uh, Richard Hanania actually is a guy I disagree with on some things, possibly, I mean, probably including some of these race issues, but um, who wrote a pretty good book about this or a very good book about this recently. I mean, where he talks about the institutional roots of quote unquote wokeness. And he makes a point that you don't really hear that often from the mainstream commentary, which is that this isn't just a dispute about vague intellectual ideas or something like that. To some extent, it's a dispute about what to do with systems that already exist. So, I mean, like, for example, the roots of wokeness are in the different expansions of the Civil Rights Act to a very significant extent. And I mean, uh, like, again, I'm pro Civil Rights Act when I said, like, with much or all of some of this stuff, I disagree with the hard right when it comes to, like, race and equality issues. But, like, the Civil Rights Act itself only protects a very small number of groups. I mean, so you're talking about race, ethnicity, nationality, Irishmen, Jews, so much at that time was probably almost as important, religion, you know, sex, which is originally thrown in there as a joke. If you read American legal history, the idea was, I'll never pass this, they have to give rights to these broads. I mean, probably in the minds of some of these senators. But um, that's about it. I guess color is added on as an adjunct category. But since then, there have been a whole number of cases. There have been a pretty large number of cases. I forget the actual name of the decision that added both gay people and anyone who IDs as trans to the Civil Rights Act a couple years ago. But in practice, when when people say things like we need to get rid of affirmative action or we need to get rid of proportional representation in business. Sorry, I've been a little clumsy about this so far, but the point is 100 percent accurate. When people say that, they have to understand that that's a very difficult thing to do. Legally. I mean, right now, and I, I trained as a lawyer at a good school, like right now, sorry, there's some kind of disaster outside there and it, fire truck screaming by and so hopefully everyone's okay. But anyway, so <laughs> proportional repre- the lack of proportional representation in business employment, if you have more than 15 employees, is a de facto basis for a lawsuit. It's not going to win you the case, but you can bring a suit on those grounds. And that is the just justificatory reason for affirmative action in practice. If you hire only the best qualified people as determined by an IQ test, which is, in fact, under Griggs, 1971, now probably illegal, you're not going to get a proportionate mix of people who happen to be probably in order native, then black, then Hispanic, then white, then Asian. So to do that in any situation, if you're a fairly elite college, top 500 of them, or you're a Fortune 1000 company, you're going to have to institute some kind of program with a name like Balanced Workforce and bring people in unfairly, if we're being blunt. That's what's going to be needed given the current score gaps, given the current graduation gaps, especially for Hispanics, for you to get anything that looks like 60%, 10%, or 12%, 15%. So saying like, well, affirmative action's done now, it's been struck down at a couple of elite colleges, I mean, first of all, that decision, as I understand, doesn't automatically apply to any other sector. 
It doesn't apply to all business. It doesn't apply to tech business. It doesn't apply to prep schools. So all of those would be individual cases. And the center-right justices actually provide a loophole right in that case where they say you can't just use race as a factor, but you can use experiences with suffering that could be expected to affect test scores as a as a factor when it comes to judging applicants. So, I mean, uh, my guess would be that until we see another case five years from now, colleges are just going to focus more on, you know, the pain of racism described in the applicant's essays or something like that. Well, the future will show whether I'm right or wrong. But the point here, when you talk about peak wokeness, to actually get rid of wokeness, you'd have to dismantle the structure that makes it possible. And I've just done, you know, kind of blah, 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 but in pretty fair breakdown, an analysis of the laws there, but also in every business. Now, I mean, you have a department, a very large department of HR that focuses primarily on this kind of stuff, as well as sexual harassment, as Hanania points out. You have, in many cases, a department of diversity or DEI. I couldn't think of an F-1000 without one. You've got other things, like I mentioned, balanced workforce, which is the goals process that's in place in a lot of companies you know, what an ESG, SEL, to really get rid of wokeness, you'd have to get rid of all of that. So I think right now what you've seen is public opinion turning against these policies, but that doesn't really matter much. I mean, like public opinion during the Iraq war turned against extraordinary rendition and torture um, on the part of the military. But as far as I can understand from the cases, those things are still fully legal. The army just doesn't talk about them. So, I mean, the the question is, what will actually change on the ground? Like, is Harvard getting rid of its 72 diversity employees? No, Mm, not not right now. Well, I mean, so you're talking about, um, you know, Dick Kanania's uh, book. And, you know, his argument is interesting because conservatives since, um, I mean, I guess like, I mean, it was before Breitbart, but uh, before the original, you know, before Breitbart, um, he said, uh, you know, politics is downstream of culture. And what Hanani is actually saying is, no, 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 the culture has been shaped uh, by the politics. And he's actually, um, you know, wrote a book that came out at about the same time, on a similar time. So the origins of woke, right? Civil rights, mm-hmm. law, corporate America, triumph of identity politics. And like uh, Dick was on this podcast. I, I know Dick pretty well. Um, and uh, I'm trying to make Dick happen. But uh, in any case, <laughs> um, so, so he wrote that book. And then like um, Rufo wrote uh, a book uh about the, kind of a similar topic but he focused on the culture and kind of like the bottom up ideology and how that shaped uh politics um i'm not going to like say which is more important but it seems that um they are working in synergy so uh, rufo's american cultural revolution how the radical left conquered everything it does yeah. seem like there is there is a synergy there though right because um, the legal framework was there to operate upon, and the NGOs, the uh, you know the uh, the academy, um, you know the legal profession, they started pushing these radical views in the context of this law, which provided them the opportunity, and so they're execute they're they're interpreting the law. They interpret the law by their lights. You know, by what they think is reasonable. What they think is reasonable is shaped by the culture coming out of academia. And so I think in, in some ways, why not both? They're both right. Um, obviously, if there was no law, if there's no civil rights law, uh, it would be I, I don't actually know how they would intimidate corporations into doing what they're what what they're doing, because I think you're right. The law provides a really straightforward framework. Uh, for corporations, like okay, like you know, you interview X number of people, you have this number of people in this sort of, uh, you know, position, et cetera, et cetera. Like, you know, it's actionable. Um, on the other hand, there are, there are laws out there that people kind of like enforced and ignored, right? So you need the will, uh, to enforce that law. Um, you know, for example, um, there are plagiarism rules at Harvard. Uh, that apparently have not been enforced, you know, but the rules are there. Why Why aren't they enforced? Well, you know, I mean, look, I mean, what was the last time at Harvard? I mean, aside from Ted Kennedy, when was the last time you heard about a plagiarism scandal at Harvard? Look, they got into Harvard. That's 99% of the game. You got into Harvard. Now give them a degree and let them go to McKinsey, hmm. you know? And so, I mean, it, there's like a, there's like multiple games here that I think they're going. But, you know, your point is taking like we still have the legal framework. We still have the legal framework. And even if the culture as a whole opposes something, that doesn't really matter. 
Um, you know, I'm in Texas right now. It's a pro-life. It's it legislation is pro-life. Um, but if there was a if there was a, a single issue uh, referendum, I'm 99 percent sure uh, that abortion would be legal again. Of you know. Yeah. So, I mean, just like one quick comment there, like abortion, most successful people make decisions in an almost entirely amoral fashion. I mean, this is one of the most replicable conclusions in psychology. There's actually a really interesting conversation about whether morality is real at all. Like we all agree that humans have an empathic sense, but I mean, that varies from person to person. And the question of whether there's any objective observer of this process who cares, I mean, I frankly tend to say no. Um, is the deepest question of, of human philosophy. But I mean, even aside from what should be or what might be, just like in practice, most people's decision-making calculus, when you get beyond very unsuccessful, overly empathic people and beyond like priests and saints, is basically just based on the simple analysis of does this benefit me more than it harms me? Like there are a whole bunch of things, like pornography is the other obvious example, that are easy to attack on some kind of ethical grounds. Like 2% of these people could be trafficked and I mean, the general person's response is, well, 98% of them aren't. Uh, my watching this isn't going to really impact whether anyone in the videos from 10 years ago is or is not. And I sometimes like watching this with my girl after dates or before them. I mean, or, you know, just by myself if that fails. You know, I mean, so the about an 80% majority of men, I think 56% majority of women use pornography, quote unquote. So every time you actually see votes on should porn be banned? Should there be radical restrictions on erotica? You see radical feminists and evangelicals making like a huge amount of noise up front. And then you see the ordinary person who has a couple copies of Hustler and some downloads on their computer just saying, hell no, in the privacy of the voting booth. And abortion is- uh, wait, 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 bro. bro. Let's keep it here real. No ordinary person has a couple of copies yeah, no, of I'm Hustler just, today. No, it's no, it's a dated <laughs> line. But like, look, almost- <laughs> Okay, cool. I'm not. I got, no, I, got, I got Zoomers listening who have no idea what you just said. But anyway, I think they I mean, get your sentiment. You know, the website that grew out of the magazine is one of the biggest contributors to porn. I mean, people know what fucking porn is. But the basic point, though, is that the percentage of people that watch porn on the internet, and actually, that's not really true, by the way. I mean, like, there's still a few. I, I think most of this is targeted at women. Honestly, when you look at like this whole genre of bodice rippers with names like he took me number seven with pictures. But I mean, like if you look at Ella's uh, survey of like human kinks, almost as many people use like written and visual erotica as used Internet pornography. And the percentage of people that used one or the other was, again, almost 100. It was over 80 percent for men. But my point there wasn't like what delivery mechanism dudes prefer. It was if you actually give people a chance to go into a voting booth and vote to ban all porn and kick all 2 million current thoughts off OnlyFans and just never see this stuff again, no one is going to vote yes. So there's a difference between virtue signaling behavior in public and actual behavior in private. And I think that was just a lead into, I think abortion is the ultimate example of this because almost everyone, almost no one actually believes that like week two blastocysts are people. Again, there we've both read and perhaps helped design some of the studies on this. I mean, it's, nobody does. It, almost every woman can conceive of a situation, rape or a one night stand that went badly wrong, which results in a pregnancy. Two months in, you decide what you're going to do about that. So again, the arguments like, well, isn't there an ethical risk to ever taking human life are morally interesting, but almost no one is swayed by them. And like, I don't, I don't want to go on a long speech again. Like we see this with the situation in Texas, right? Where there's the the woman is pregnant, the baby has some debilitating medical condition, so it's probably going to die in her body. Like it's probably in pain right now. And the question is, can she get a DNC to remove the baby, or does she have to give birth to the baby as part of some horrible procedure about seven months in, where it's going to be born and then they're going to kill it? Like they're going to give it painkillers that stop the poor little creature from breathing. And the answer of the right in Texas is. Well, no, because the baby's technically alive now, you should never be able to take a life. And the ordinary person is looking at that and saying, this sounds completely insane to me. So yes, I, I have no doubt, bit of a sideline there, but I have no doubt that if you were to actually put that to a vote, like three-fourths or more of women would vote either just for legal abortion or for major exceptions to any rule that held most abortion to be illegal. All right, I'm going to ask kind of a weird question here. Um, yeah. You're in an HBCU. Um, yep. 
What do your colleagues think about Ibram Kendi? Like, what do they say behind closed doors? Well, actually, he's never really come up, which I think is in itself telling. I mean, so most of my colleagues that I can think of, I mean, Fred Williams, a former major with the Kentucky State Police, Reginald Thomas, who teaches criminal justice. He's a state senator. Uh, Dr. Amadife, one of my colleagues, one of the better Africanists in the game. I mean, they're all just sort of state U professors. Like, I mean, they're busy with their methods models. Um, I've never once heard one of them refer to Ibram Kendry other than maybe a a chuckle over an op-ed or something like that. And I think that in and of itself is telling. I mean, the Ibram Kendi audience isn't black statisticians. It's guilty white people. I mean, and that, that was one of the big things about the whole BLM movement, right? Like 70% of the rioters that were arrested, even in downtown Minneapolis, even in the South, were white. I mean, they were kids who'd come there basically to fight, to overturn a system they thought was unjust. And they were doing that by breaking shit in middle class black neighborhoods very, very often. Like when they burnt down the Lake Street black and Asian business district in Minneapolis. So, I mean, I've always thought that Kendi's audience was kind of white people who wanted to support a hip, sympathetic looking brother that was explaining that the only problem in society was their racism. And I mean, I, I think that when you look at like the black scholars on point, now they're just as many annoying woke black people. I mean, uh, per, per capita. I mean, uh, you know, not denying that. But when you look at like serious black scholars like Roland Fry or William Julius Wilson, I mean, they're not really citing Kendi that much. They're looking at empirically, is there actually a difference between black and white rates of police shooting? And, you know, 90 percent of the time there's not. So I, I hear very little about Ibram Kendi. The only thing I've ever heard about Robin DiAngelo, uh, you know, his his homie, Batman and Robin, I'm not going to name the colleague who said this, but he was talking about some of the scenes in her book. Like there's one where she goes on a date with a black guy, seems like a perfectly nice guy. And all she could think of, she said, was black jokes. And my what colleague, the, what, what the <laughs> no, she was like, she was sitting there. She's like mildly attracted to him. It was a nice dinner. You know, she had the salmon, but like she, she couldn't think about how to talk with this black guy. And I, I may be paraphrasing this a little, I may be getting some of this wrong, but she says all she could think of were jokes and like ethnic debates in her family and so on. And then she said something like, all white people think this way. And my colleague was like, this, this broad seems nuts, basically. You know, and that, that, that was it. The take was like these very guilty white people trying to comment on black issues seem to be projecting a lot of their pathologies outward. And I mean, I think that's, if I had to do a one sentence pop psychoanalysis here, it would kind of be like Robin D'Angelo probably came from, given the name and area background, sort of a working class, possibly at least somewhat bigoted white family, has some suppressed thoughts herself and thinks that everyone does. But in fact, the average like white jock from the suburbs doesn't. And that's why the reaction to her book has often, the conversations that follow it become so silly, where someone will say, well, I'm not a racist in the sense you're describing. And the diversity trainer type will then have to say, well, one of the first signs of being a racist is denying you're a racist. I mean, so I, you don't hear a lot about that, that sort of thing in serious black academia, in my experience. Yeah. Um, I do have to say um, there was a uh, SNL parody, SNL commercial about um, after Trump won. Uh, <laughs> um, it was about Brooklyn. Um, and it's basically, oh, it's Brooklyn's in the bubble. What if Trump didn't win and all the cars are hybrid and all this stuff? Um, the coffee shops are all like fresh ground coffee. And then it shows a woman reading um, Between the World and Me mm-hmm. by Ta-Nehisi Co- <laughs> And Everyone just starts crack- cracking up. That's and, um, you know, uh, people were like, I mean, I think ta actually specifically said that he was like, what does that even mean? Like, why are white people reading my book? And, you know, and um, – what was it Colin, Colin Powell was like, oh wait, wait. The, so who is this? He like asked his assistant, who is this Tanahasi Coates? Is he like the new black guy that white people are into? <laughs> that captured something really, really like deep there, right? Um, in terms of like, I'm, I'm sure Tanahasi is sincere, but you know, uh, he's you know his 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 intergenerational wealth is driven by um, awfuls, you know, affluent white liberal females purchasing his book. So um, it's it's a really strange situation. Yeah, no, I think that's correct. I mean, one of the findings in when we talked about Ella Girl's sex survey was that the people that were most into like hyper male dominant extreme sex weren't men. They were all women 
they tended to lean kind of upper middle class. And I guess the idea was a desire for discipline or strong father figure, someone to correct them or something. The analysis is actually pretty interesting. But there's something kind of similar here. And I'm saying that because it borders on the masochistic. Like there's a real demand among upper middle class whites. Like I've always liked the term awful for like rich white ladies, uh, affluent white female liberal. And he just went there. But I mean, there's a huge demand for like black guys to say that your racism is the problem with society. It's all your father's fault. And I think the motivation there is that then the idea is that you can go out and fix it. Like if you modify the racism in your group of Chardonnay sipping housewives, that's going to have a real practical impact on like the average black dude in Watts. So, I mean, I, I think that there's an element of I'm, again, not a psychologist, I'm a political scientist, but there's an obvious element of like centering yourself and what you can do to this. So, like, there are all these books, actually, like Nice Racism. I think that's another D'Angelo uh, topic. You have Sierra Rao and Regina Jackson that will literally go to dinner in like lower upper class white neighborhoods and scream at these white women about racism as they are served food and before they are paid $10,000. I mean, and the, the appeal of that is not necessarily a real desire to go to the ghetto and help. It's a desire to feel that you're part of the ruling class, you're responsible for this problem, and you, you know, Barnard educated young woman can solve it. If you accept the real problem, the black community is black dudes shooting each other. I mean, that you don't have a role to play. And it's also tougher to process, probably. You've been told you can't think that. Is there a problem with them? Can't be. So, you know, you grew up in Chicago um, and you're talking about the black community and stuff like that. Um, you mentioned your your mom is from an upper class background. So mm-hmm. just like the talent in 10th, uh, Jack and Jill, like that sort of set. Is that still around? Oh, yeah. Yeah, my mom, uh, I think my mom, I now looking back, my mom tried to probably introduce me to some of that at an early age. I mean, certainly there was reading and even I mentioned the incredibly exotic things like with watercolor paints and calligraphy brushes around. She'd encourage me to do things with them. Um, she wanted me to meet the family early on. I mildly regret not doing that more. And yeah, she wanted me to do some of those kind of activities. Like I recall she wanted me to go to IMSA, which is the Illinois Math and Science Academy, uh, just outside of Chicago. It's actually in suburban Aurora. And the idea was that I'd go to this prep school and I would also do, there were some black programs she wanted me to do while I was there that were in that surrounding area, like in you know, a suburban minority community. Um, and I, I actually just didn't want to do that. I wanted to go to the local public high school, East Aurora, and be an athlete there and study a lot less, which is what ended up happening. And it turns out that's probably an advantage when it came to me applying to college because we didn't have that many applicants to like Illinois or Brown or whatever from, you know, EA. But uh, she definitely pushed that stuff. I didn't really do it, but is it still there? Oh yeah. I mean, it's, um, who is it? Uh, uh Lawrence Otis Graham wrote our, yeah, our, our, our kind of people from 1999. Yeah. Decades ago. I read that book. It's a good book. Yeah, a good book. A new edition, as I recall, just came out and he talks about all this stuff and almost every one of those organizations that he talks about, like, you know, the alphas, the deltas and the AKAs are very prominent on our campus. I can't think of an HBCU where that's not true. They, they do good work in the community. Um, the Bull, if I'm pronouncing that correctly, I'm not a member, at least at present. Couldn't say if I was. But I mean, like they are, I mean, that that's known as one of the four or five men's business groups. They admit a few whites now in most cities. Yeah, all that stuff's still around. Uh, Jack and Jill almost certainly is. When you create an organization and it has a pretty good mission, especially if it's kind of racialist. So it's like, you know, the Hibernian American society, you know, they're going to be Irishmen in 100 years. You know, it's, it generally doesn't go anywhere. So, yeah, the the black upper middle class is still very much there and kind of trying to figure out what to do. Right. Because, I mean, you're starting to see black billionaires almost proportionately now. Like we still haven't caught up on the tests, but I mean, we're, we benefit a bit from affirmative action, control the music game. So you're seeing people like Jay-Z, multiple eight, nine billion. So there's a question on one hand of can we still blame racism for everything when we see this massive successful clade over here and we know exactly how they got successful. Uh, that's a big debate in the black upper middle class where, you know, where fall it's some of my friends, but the group itself. Yeah, it's, just, it's growing. They're more well, so, I mean, I, now than there were in 1970. Yeah, for sure. For sure. Um, so I, I guess I, I have two questions. I'm, I'm kind of curious about like heterogeneity uh, because um, I mean, I know this is not true intellectually, but, um, you know, uh, I, I don't like know the community. Like, you know, I mean, I live in Austin, not many 
Um, anyway, I don't want to get into it, but uh, mostly like I hang out with white and Asian people, okay, a couple of Latinx people, whatever, um, <laughs> you know. But um, so I don't know, I don't know firsthand. Um, I know intellectually. So, what is the attitude and the position to the fact that, like, so for example, at Harvard, they're not going to do an ethnographic survey of the black students oh, quite yeah. clearly because th- they don't want to. They don't want people to know that there's so many African immigrant children and Caribbean and whatnot. Like, is that spoken of in the ADOS, you know, American descendant of the slaves? I mean, I know it is uh, like on social media and stuff, but does it show up at HBCUs? I mean, in, in terms of discussions, like what's going on here? And then the uh, other question that I want to ask is, uh, you know, America, we have a tradition of hypo descent, um, one drop of black blood, unless you're Latino, apparently. Um, how far is that going to go? Because we're starting to get into the period where it's like, you know, I know people that are a fourth and an eighth black and sure. yeah, they're, I guess like, you know, they have a grandparent who's black. But like, I mean, this is just starting to get ridiculous. Yeah, well, it was a frankly alt-right writer, uh, John Derbyshire. Um, I was actually reading him while critiquing like the hard right. But this line was actually pretty funny where he was like, when you think about it in business, there has to be an ideal percentage of black, quote unquote, blood, like something like a fourth would be perfect because you just look to, you know, to women and employers like a handsome, like Lebanese gentleman, but you'd benefit from all the affirmative action benefits. And at a fourth, no one would question you. And I was kind of like, you know, okay, honorable. Wait, opponent. Wait, wait, wait. Stop, stop, talk- stop talking about Thomas Chatterton Williams. Stop talking about Thomas uh, Chatterton Williams. But it's, it was just like, okay, I'm going to disagree with most of what this guy says in this essay, but that's laugh out loud funny. And he like explains like, you know, some programs have a cutoff of an eighth, so you wouldn't want to be that, but you wouldn't necessarily want to be half. It's, it's, a, it's a solid line. But you actually see that a fair amount in the black community. Like you see guys where you understand like if this guy and his girlfriend, the blonde cheerleader have a kid, there's a point at which those kids are in practice, just going to be white. They're just going to be Southern European. That's neither good nor bad, but just genetically that's kind of what's going on. So, I mean, obviously there's a discussion of that. So what you said about the um, the distribution of black students at Ivy League institutions, not just Harvard, that's a point that actually I think it was uh, W.J. Dub, William Julius Wilson, that made made decades ago. It's more true now. But he said, I mean, the, the question with affirmative action isn't just, you know, theoretically, would this be a boost for descendants of slaves, but does it actually benefit any such people? And I mean, by his estimate at that time, I think it was three quarters of the black students at Harvard were either biracial, uh, African, not not even specifically Caribbean, or from just very wealthy families, like people who quite likely had been free in the 1700s, you know, children of Benjamin Banneker and that kind of thing. And so the question is, what are you doing in terms of giving these people an advantage over, you know, their white buddies from Martha's Vineyard at an institution like this? You know, even if we just applied the test scores correctly, those kids with their 1350s would just go to, you know, Purdue Honors College or something like there would be no massive negative impacts. Why don't we do that? Um, I guess what I'm saying is, yes, the patterns are recognized. No, they haven't changed. And no, nothing's been done about them. Another kind of uh, point in the whole culturalist hereditarian debate on IQ would be we're not talking about stable groups, right? So, I mean, like, how would you boost black IQ scores? I mean, there are a bunch of ways that a lot of Americans might feel are too eugenic, Um, you know, link welfare payments where you obviously can't support yourself to use of birth control while you're on the program. It's something that's been suggested in major developing world powers. You know, you can have your own moral opinion on that, but it would obviously work. Um, Subsidize high performing families. You could do the same with athletic whites to have children. Nothing particularly complex about that. But another thing would just be when you said let in anyone from the the black and brown powers who has a master's or above in STEM. Why not? 500,000 Nigerians a year. There are only, what, 38 million black people? I mean, you'd see massive changes beginning quite rapidly. So, again, we're not supposed to talk about this kind of human stock breeding because it's evil or whatever. But, I mean, yes, like people in the black community obviously notice it's just there's not really much to be done. There's some hostility between Eidos Blacks and uh, newly arriving Blacks, in part because Black Americans often uh, are not viewed very highly by people from like the Nigerian ruling class. And it's, it's obviously not a genetic thing. It's just like, obviously, most of your problems here are your fault. And there's, there's almost nothing more poisonous to tell a modern Black American. Yeah, yeah. I mean, I yeah. <laughs> um, I, I don't want to get into I, I Yeah, I, I, I do have some acquaintances that are from Nigeria and they have a 
uh, Jamaican spicy things to say. Let's just put it that way, <laughs> um, which I will not repeat because I don't want to get canceled. I mean, I've, I've heard friends say crazy stuff. And I don't think we're going to get canceled. I'm not saying this, but I mean, like people have said things like, yeah, you lost the war. We sold you over here. And since then, you have learned very little. I mean, it's just sort of it's that take in other societies like China and Nigeria, India, of course. I mean, there, there's an idiotic Western condescension toward India. I mean, much of India was you know, based around highly stable kingdoms and city states where people were painting themselves blue and hunting wild pigs in most of Europe. But there, there's an attitude toward these other societies that that's largely unjustified. And in practice, people from those societies are often much more capable of non-softened analysis than Westerners, in my experience. So, yeah, I mean, the things that East Asians or West Africans will say about Americans in general, like they think the whites are insane. If you cut off, yeah, your, yeah. Well, what well is, um, I mean, like it's all of that is uh, perhaps of value to our national conversation. It's a counter to this excessive empathy problem we have. Uh, well, I mean, you know, there is um, that joke that's going a lot as we're recording right now that uh, Vivek uh, Ramaswamy um, is is the one bringing replacement theory to America. You know, it you takes a brown man to. It takes, yeah. yeah, it, it takes a, a brown man to do um, the white nationalist job now. Yeah. Well, that also, I mean, like one of the jokes on Twitter and 4chan is just sort of like, well, when you accuse a group of people of being racist and you actually pull up like PFPs and so on, you see it's like, you know, three whites, two West African blacks, three Indians, two Chinese guys. I mean, so like who, how diverse are the people screaming you are bigots as versus the people being attacked? So like white nationalism in the sense that Kendi or D'Angelo would mean is one of the, has to be one of the most diverse we would both be accused of it quite likely, you know, well, 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 in the US. Well, well, yeah, yeah, it's called multiracial whiteness. <laughs> yeah, like the, the school district that literally listed, uh, it was Japanese and Nigerian kids as white. And like, to some extent, you have to look at this and just laugh. Like, those are the other options. Like, when you look at the great human civilizations, there's like East Asia, India, you could throw in Ethiopia and West Africa. What? Peru. I mean, the the people that you are now labeling white, oh, the Arabs, of course, were literally the other people who built tall buildings throughout history. It just doesn't make sense. There are characteristics of civilization, would be a simple way to put this, that bring success in every society. And the, the fact is that a great many Chinese and Nigerians and Indians have them, and a fair number of Western white and black Americans don't. And you're going to see those characteristics tell out when you look at the performance of those five different groups. So uh, you don't you don't need to come up with some idiotic rationale like oh yeah that jet black chief son from Africa white guy you, you don't you don't need to do that you can just you can just explain what's going on. So um, you know you're a political scientist um, and uh, you know you do you know methods and whatnot. Um, there's like arguments arguments in this country about whether America is you know going to collapse or whether you know our greatest times. Um, are ahead of us and you know i guess like here like as i'm as i'm recording right now i'm probably feeling not necessarily optimistic about america but very bearish about the rest of the world and so i actually think we're gonna do okay positionally um but um i think there's gonna be some problems uh you know the number of young people is gonna decrease when you have a decreased number of young people that just causes downstream effects and um i do think uh you know my friend um antonio uh uh, Garcia Martinez or Martinez mm -hmm. Garcia. I I don't know these like double named Latinx people. But anyway, he uh you know like it, you know Clubhouse and like TikTok all these like, age of orality and I basically said like okay this is moronic. Uh these kids are are they have no attention span, they're dumb. So I think there's a lot of negative things happening, but you know they're happening all over the world and um you know we still have Silicon Valley, you know we we're, we're the the AI Basically, the AI revolution is happening in the Mission District of San Francisco. That is how concentrated uh, some of these uh, revolutionary changes are in this world. Most of them are in the United States. There's very few unicorns in Europe, like maybe Spotify, a few others, right? Um, so that's how I'm feeling. But uh, you're a political scientist. You know, we're going to have an election, um, fall 2024. Right now, Trump is leading the polls, et cetera, et cetera. Um, we still have moderate inflation. Um, you know, where, where are we right now and where are we going, Wilfred? Like, what are you thinking? Well, I mean, I, I think your analysis is basically correct. So I am a professional skeptic of doomsday predictions. 
I mean, this is actually something that should be one of my next pretty serious articles, like journal or long form. But I mean, so like when people talk about the most extreme climate change predictions, there are specific mistakes that are being made, like relying on worst case scenarios from unreliable models that we've seen a dozen times before, like the population bomb, still like the second best selling book in the social sciences, the world's going to end by 1980 was just entirely wrong. And the guy who wrote that book is still appearing on CNN and MSNBC, Dr. Paul Ehrlich. But that's just one of many. I mean, like peak oil, you know, one, two, three, four, five, six, and seven, you know, the green tech boom that was supposed to happen 20 years ago, Y2K, although there at least we just had to change the codes, but killer bees and the great northerly migration, the club of Rome, every resource was going to become unobtainable. All of these in the like post 1960s, 1970s modern era. And I, I think we're going through this again. Oh, global cooling, never as big a deal as the right says, but like page two of Newsweek, just on and on and on. The Western heterosexual AIDS epidemic. So when people look at models showing increases in ra trackable racial tension or something, they say, you know, America is falling, my least favorite Twitter line. Uh, no, I, I don't think that's correct. I think the worst case scenario for the USA would be pretty much what we saw for Britain, where there's growth, but there's growth at a slow pace relative to rising powers. There are political and ethnic tensions and so on down the line. So you kind of see a stagnation in quality of life throughout much of the UK you know, high level ODs and suicides, which we're already seeing here, so on. But I mean, Britain is still like the eighth ranked power in the world, something like that. So I think that's the worst case scenario, like China, India, maybe one of the BRICS type black African states or Brazil surges up to our level or a little past. Uh, but we're we're still right there. I mean, you know, I'm from downtown Chicago, our mile spire buildings aren't going anywhere. New York's even bigger. You mentioned SF, they're a contender when it comes to tech, you know, throughout the country, you know, there's there's some dead cities. Detroit and Baltimore might be falling in that category. But no, I mean, the, the large majority of the USA, which is a continental power, we're allied with Canada, which is almost a continental power. Mexico, we think of as a little brother neighbor. That's almost 200 million people. Like, no, the, the North Am block is not going anywhere. We're not going to collapse into ethnic war. We also have nuclear weapons on this sort of thing. I mean, the idea that the USA would be invaded or that a race war here would be allowed to get out of hand before you know, the army hellfire missile started hitting the two armies and breaking them apart. I mean, this is an unrealistic nonsense. So no, the USA will continue on for quite a while. Will we see increased federalism, uh, increased drug issues, that kind of thing? That's quite possible, but we're not going to see dissolution of the country or any, anything similar. It's my take. All right. So uh, I want to close out. Um, I want to ask you about Kentucky. Uh, so I've been to Kentucky. Just so people know I have been to Kentucky. I've been to Paducah. Um, so i um, been through Louisville. Uh, been in central Kentucky on some rest stops. Um, you're in Kentucky. People don't know too much about Kentucky. Uh, it actually has like, I mean, Louisville is a great from what I mean, I have a friend from Louisville, so I'm not going to say it's a bad. I mean, it's a great city. You know, it's kind of a different city than the rest of Kentucky in some ways. Kentucky's, you know, got like some regionality. So Paducah is definitely like the South, I would say. Uh, but like, you know, there's Appalachia and Eastern Kentucky, some of the, you know, poorest, most deprived areas of the country are actually in eastern Kentucky. And then obviously Louisville is like, you know, right across from Ohio. So there's there's that stuff going on. Um, but, uh, you know, it, it, it feels very flyover -y to me. I know people in Indiana look down on Kentucky. Um, and uh, Kentucky is kind of a byword for being kind of backward uh, in large parts of the country. I don't know why specifically Kentucky, but that is just a thing. Uh, people don't talk about West Virginia as much because – I don't know. It's just like West Virginia doesn't like roll off. So, for example, I went to University of Oregon in Eugene, Oregon, and uh, uh, its sister city, its city right across the river is Springfield, um, Springfield, Oregon. And actually, um, the writers for The Simpsons uh, spent some time in Portland and uh, Shelbyville is Eugene and Springfield is probably Springfield, Oregon. But in any case, um, so Springfield, um, people in Eugene sometimes call it Spring Tucky, you know, mm. and uh, like, wait, why why Spring Tucky? Well, you know, it's like poor. Uh, it used to be a mill town um, because of uh, unwinding of, of the forestry industry. Well, pro basically productivity gains got high, and so you don't need as many people, right? So it's a, it's a little bit poorer, uh, a little bit more rundown. That's so what I call it, you know, uh, Spring Tucky. But um, you know, you live in you live in what like Frankfurt? Is that where you live? Yeah. So, I mean, like, I, I think there's a lot there. Like, first of all, one of the things that I've always found weird as a Chicagoan is kind of the coastal idea that in the Midwest of the country, there's not much to be found. Like, I mean, Chicago, 
I, I'm not going to get into one of those endless like New York, Chicago, LA, DC conversations. But like Chicago is about ten times the size of Boston. Like Metro, but no, I mean that's not quite fair. Like five, like Metroplex. If you're counting an honest Metroplex, would be about ten million to two million, maybe. I mean, New York, of course, is bigger, but I mean, like the the Bosniwash corridor. If we were seriously like talking cities, would have to go up against the Great Lakes Metroplex, like the curve of the inland seas, with like Toronto, Montreal, Chicago, Detroit, Cleveland, all the Ohio cities. So I mean, like I've the area where I'm from, like in Center City, Chicago, is actually the most urban area I've lived. Manhattan is a little more urbanized. But like places like Ciudad de Mexico or like downtown Detroit or San Francisco seemed a little bit more rustic, frankly. So I've never gotten that. And I, I think that that attitude that you get toward like Chicago or Montreal or certainly like Cleveland extends even more dramatically if you go like five miles inland from the Great Lakes. So, I mean, in reality, where I live in Kentucky is actually like surprisingly mundane. So the population of Kentucky is all concentrated in like a one triangular area, which is like Louisville over here, Frankfurt, which is the capital city in the middle, maybe the hundred thousand people during the day. It's the smallest by far. Lexington, which is like 400,000 over here. Cincinnati, which is like 3 million up here. And I guess Louisville, like a million, 2 million. But I mean, so most of the area between those four cities, all of which are like 40 minutes apart is again, just well-maintained farms and tall buildings. So there, there's really nothing all that interesting, which is actually something that, I mean, it's a great, I mean, it's a great social area, the Derby in Louisville. But I mean, like when people have come down, they're like, what are all these nightclubs? I thought there'd be like guys sitting on porches playing gut fiddles and banjos and so on. So no, not really. The, the association with Kentucky that I think produces that is with the Appalachian Highlands to the east. So yeah, like five of the 10 poorest counties in the USA are in Appalachian, Kentucky. And this again, like one of the things that I focus it's a, on, it's, a, it's, a, it's, a, it's that's the legacy of white supremacy. That's what Ibra, Dr. Ibram Kendi would tell you. Well, the interesting thing about that is that like a lot of these guys, there's a term I once heard from a boss who'd been a Marine and the term was thin intelligent, which was his word for people that are like kind of smart seeming like they know how to wear a tie, but they've really only re- they've read through like nine historical facts and don't know anything else. So that's how slavery strikes me with a lot of the black left. Like, you've got to understand, we were once enslaved. And the idea is that that's the ender of conversations about reparations and so on. And if you bring up, well, the Native Americans were defeated in a series of wars that lasted 400 years. They're like, well, all the poor whites also came here as, well, if you prefer, they came here as bond servants. But, you know, bond servitude wasn't illegal until a couple of years after the Civil War. When you make these points, it's just sort of like, well, why didn't I know that? Uh, Eastern Kentucky actually is the legacy of that. Like what's talked about in White Cargo where Britain for a long time just dumped its poor people and its criminals and so on in like the less populated colonies and territories. Um, So yeah, I mean, you can trace like the descendants of the freed indentured servants and so on in Kentucky, Ohio, so on to this day. But for whatever reason, uh, yeah, Eastern Kentucky, I think if you start with Harlan and go down, has five of the 10 poorest counties in the country. And again, in terms of like real history, I don't think any of the poorest counties in the country are majority black, actually. Uh, East St. Louis might get in like 10 or 11. They're all poor white areas or native Indian reservations. Murder's a little bit lower, but like suicide, opiates, all that stuff is through the roof. It's just nobody really gives a shit because nobody, there are no news networks there. You know, like news comes out of Harlan, like there was a giant biker brawl or they busted an opiate ring or something like that. When it goes to the Kentucky papers in Louisville and Lexington, and then what, four days later circulates to the AP wire. So there's not the constant barrage that you get with, you know, black crime in the cities or something like that, or the mob back in the day. But it's it's very much there. So uh, I guess like, you know, um, some academics complain that they have to live in the middle of nowhere, but you don't sound like you got that problem in Frank uh, Franklin. uh you like it there, or Frankfurt, You li- or that, that area. You like it there. Yeah, I like it well enough. I mean, like, it, in fact, I like Frankfurt a lot. But again, the the idea, everything is relative and contextual. So if I drive 40 minutes east, I'm in downtown Louisville. I mean, so I actually don't feel, and I might have a bit of quote unquote privilege here. Like there are people that teach at like Utah State that I would assume are really in the Bundu to some extent. Like you're in a ski town, you're several hours from Salt Lake City, and there are no other cities nearby. And I can understand that attitude in that case. But the large majority of academics, unless they come from downtown New York City or Chicago, and unless they're in that situation, I think they're just kind of griping. 
you know, I mean, I, I don't think too many people actually have a problem living, you know, where the University of Illinois is or Penn State is, or the University of Michigan is, so on down the line. No, I, I think you make a good point. That you're like not that far of a driveway. So, like, I mean, why are you, you know, it's just like living in the suburbs, right? Yeah, pretty much. I mean, like, yeah. Yeah, that is exactly correct, actually. So, yeah, I mean, they're all they're all pretty connected. I mean, I guess technically Frankfurt and Louisville have like little suburbs, but in practice, most people feel uh, the ability to go to any of the other cities whenever they want to. So, yeah, I'm 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 content. I enjoy K State. I don't really see myself as well. I don't know. I mean, like I've gotten other academic offers, and so far have always said no to a move on. I mean, if there was an offer in downtown D.C. or something like that, I mean, as the think tank spot opens up, who knows? But uh, right now, yeah, very, very content. Well, OK, so last question. Last question, as they say. Um, Chinese food, uh, where, you, where you live, like uh, what's it like? Is it any good? Um, you know, this is this is the measure of civilization in in Razib Khan world. So this actually this is one of the few downsides of like the central Midwest. Actually, in Louisville and Lexington, there are like just below Zagaded, like well-known Chinese restaurants in Frankfurt. Not really because the, there are very few Asian people. I mean, this is something like when you talked about the different racial demographics of different cities, like in Austin, there aren't that many blacks. So, I mean, I would imagine that has impact on everything from the musical and art scene to you know, local athletics. Like it's the same thing in Kentucky. I mean, we're about what, an 85% white, the 12% black, 3% native. I mean, there, there's not that much room left for, people from Thailand or Vietnam, um, China as well. So, I mean, like, again, in the major cities in the area, certainly like Cincinnati, if you drive up north towards Chicago, you'll find, you know, excellent Chinese food. But there's there's very little in Frankfurt. I think we have two Chinese restaurants. Wait, I'm gonna, I'm gonna, wait, wait, wait. I, I got to say something because like I know people are going to be like looking me up and stuff like that. Right. I'm going to give the statistics so that people know what where I'm coming sure. from and that I am not like a uh, – uh, white nationalist or something. Okay. Uh, uh, Austin's forty eight percent non Hispanic white, thirty three percent Latinx, eight percent Asian, eight percent Black or African American, and nine percent mixed. Okay. And uh, just my socio demographic circle tends to be mostly, uh, you know, with a lot of the Latino people here. I'm gonna I'm gonna be honest. Like uh, they're part Latino or something. I don't I don't I don't know until like it's like oh they're like. You know, okay. I mean, I I told this story. I think one uh, another uh, podcast. One of my one of my closer friends here is uh, he has a Latino. I'm going to use Gomez because it's common. He's a Latino. He has a Spanish last name. He's a fourth Mexican. Uh, he is. Uh, I mean, he's like not as built as uh the guy who played um the two twins in the social um you know um, Army Hammer. He's not as built as them, but he looks kind of like Army Hammer. So this is the, these are the kind of Latinos that I encounter here. But um, yeah, um, just like uh, you know, the the demographics here are like a little different. Um, I definitely notice when I go to like northern, like Midwest cities and northeastern cities, it feels like a black and white America much more, especially the ones that have not developed too much. Like like say Syracuse, I'm thinking Syracuse. You know, um, it's a, it's a whole different America in a way, an older America in a way, an America that like. Kind of, um, you know, it's like Ray, it's like you know Reagan's or maybe Carter's America. Whereas, like when I live in you know Austin, California, you know to some extent California, Florida, you know you go to Miami, bro, it's just like, you know, <laughs> you better be speaking Spanish because <laughs> uh, they're yeah. like, what's wrong with you if you don't? Like that's my experience. You get there and but, they're just like, no service, you know. Do you speak Spanish? I don't, so I'm like really screwed in Miami. Like I, literally, like I've been to Miami multiple times, and it's 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 an inconvenience. Yeah, I, I speak it uh, fairly well. I mean, but yeah, so I there definitely are different demographic patterns in the USA. I actually think that's pretty wholesome, and I also think I mean we need to regulate mass migration across the border. But I also don't think that's all that unusual in big countries. Again, if you look at Brazil, India, you know, the EU taken as a whole, the Roman Empire, the idea that diversity is something novel that just got introduced to the West is actually really stupid. I mean, that that's one of the kind of like dissident right arguments that just doesn't make any sense at all. Like, I mean, what, 25% of the population of the current United States used to be unsettled Native American tribesmen that were at war with the settlers. I mean, you know, the reason that the population of Mexico, we conquered the northern third of Mexico, which at that time was, quote unquote, the sector with all the paved roads. 
the reason those people didn't count as Hispanic in our population censuses is that, and there were some of the 20 million people there, we didn't count Hispanic as a category until 1973. And since that point, we've never had less than 5% Hispanics. And at first that began as unmixed Hispanic. So, I mean, just like the, the idea that different parts of the country look different, I kind of like. Like, I like going to Miami and seeing Cuban women from Florida International partying and, you know, going to, you know. I'm, the sure, I'm sure you do. I'm sure you do, Dr. Right. Riley. Yeah, that's the most appealing of them. But I mean, like, but, you know, going to De- the Detroit suburbs and seeing rich black guys mowing their lawn and going to North Dakota and seeing, like, Caucasian cowboys. There, That's part of being a, a gigantic nation. So, yeah, I mean, in Kentucky, we don't we don't have a lot of Asian people. It, it, it's it all depends what you get regionally. There's a large, no, there's a surprisingly large arriving Mexican American population actually in the the larger cities, which I started seeing just a couple of years ago, like guys doing construction or like taco trucks on the streets and so on. So that'll probably within a decade or two be five, ten, fifteen percent of the population. But no, Chinese food is one of the one of the area's weaknesses because we don't. Well, have- you know. <laughs> well, I mean, um, you know, uh, Wolf, it was great talking to you. Um, all your stuff, I'll, I'll put the links for the show notes. Um, obviously, uh, you are a, uh, you know, I think like the word rock on tour, I think that, that, that applies to you. You know, you pull out the thesaurus a little bit. <laughs> there's, uh, there's always something to talk about. Um, let's do this some other time. Um, you know, I've, I've guessed on your podcast before. Uh, you know, I'm happy to do it again. Um, but I, I hope people enjoy the conversation. And uh, hey, everyone out there, um, we're both brownish people. Uh, please don't cancel us, uh, white women. <laughs> <laughs> Fair enough. <laughs> I'm like, thanks, man. Good talking to you. Whole genome sequencing is used for adults and children every day to assess risk for thousands of diseases. Orchid, a genetics company led by scientists from Stanford, is able to do this for IVF embryos. Now, instead of waiting for a diagnosis, parents can assess if their embryos have genetic variants known to cause severe conditions before their child's even born. No other tests can detect these issues so thoroughly or so early. So check them out at orchidhealth.com. This podcast for kids.